Hello and welcome to Potentialization. And today we've got Julie Bullen, who I've known now for 20 years or so, I guess, getting mm -hmm. on that way or something like that. I've got a bad memory, but uh, it's, it's a little while. So thank you for doing this today. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, especially on a hot day like this. So shall we launch straight into it? Do you want to give us a little bit of background? Tell us about your background and how you became a business consultant. Okay. Um, I was um, I was in, in Oxford um, doing my doctorate and um, Robert McHenry, who's the guy who set up um, Oxford Psychologist Press as it was, the MBHI company as it is now, um, knocked, my friend knocked him off his bike accidentally and she was ever so worried because he was a tutor and she's saying, sorry, 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 he says, don't, don't worry about that. Have you got any spare time to help us out? And she said, yes. He said, right. I don't, uh, and she said, well, my friend Julie could help as well. And it was Robert and Betsy were working in Betsy's attic. And that was the beginning of Oxford Psychologist Press. And then us two joined them. And um, I, I don't know how many of you know MBTI, but for those of you who do, all the other three were thinking types and I was feeling type. And um, so Robert got hold of that he could do fire, get FIRO and start selling that as well, because it was way too touchy-feely for the rest of them. So it was wonderful for me because I got sent off to San Francisco twice in two years consecutive to do lots of really amazing um, personal development work, uh, very, very touchy-feely and wonderful. Um, and I stayed with them for about five years and um, learnt loads and, um, then I set off on my own and I've been uh, an independent for about 20, it's either 20 or 25 years. I'm like John, I'm not, uh, not a detailed numbery type person. So, um, so that's how it all happened really. I trained as a clinical psychologist before that, um, but I found it a bit too depressing. So, um, and then I found academia a bit too inaccessible. I just felt like is this really going to help the world? Um, and so then I was, and then, so then as a business psychologist, um, I've just found it wonderful. And MBTI has been a, um, a center part, part of my practice with people one-to-one -one and in teams and in organizational change um, and in conflict. I, I know I've heard you say a couple more about the bike, but I've never even thought before. Was your is your friend a psychologist? That was a coincidence that she knew you and yes, we were doing our doctorate at the same time. So, um, so, so um, yeah, and we've both been sort of thinking, oh no, we don't want to do academia. What are we going to do? So, <laughs> what a coincidence! And then that set off. Oh, um, there's loads of them. <laughs> that company now is one of the major. Oh, totally. Yes. Yeah. And and now they um. It sort of it started in America, of course, and then and I think we were the first outpost from California, and then it's all over Europe now. That all these the MBTI companies, um, but they do still do the other psychometrics as well. Cool. So yes, and here we are, several years later, or a few years later. Twenty so years later. <laughs> do you want to take us through the basics of what okay. young gen types are? Because I think there's four, aren't there? Can, yes, there are. can I just quickly ask um, if people already know, you know, people who know it or people, and if you've got nothing, go like that. So do you, does anyone already know it? You're a nothing. You already know it. You already know it. Um, I don't, um, do I need to put my hand up? You, you already know. All right, Karen. So that's brilliant. You're the only kind of um, MBTI virgin. <laughs> so um, all of us can be part of um, helping bring up to speed and then start playing around with it. Um, so Myers-Briggs type indicator is what those letters stand for. <clears throat> and Myers and Briggs were a mother-daughter team who created the questionnaire. But where the ideas came from originally was from Carl Jung. I don't know if you've heard of him, but um, we've got, yeah, all the Jungian therapy and everything. And this was one of his many wonderful models. And um, it started with um, external and internal. So he was really the inventor of the words extroversion and introversion. Although I'm sure lots of other people had thought of this and seen it in people. 
So he was saying, you know, there's an external world that we ha all have to pay attention to. And there's an internal world that we all have to pay attention to. And he just started to notice that some people were more veering to the external world, it was more important to them. And other people veered more to the internal world, it was more important to them. And then one of the things that MB, uh, Mice and Briggs brought in that helped understand this concept is actually handedness. So, it's, so it, when it, whenever the brain has two things to do, or has two hands or has two feet, it seems that genetics make it that one is the lead and the other is the support. So most of us are right or left-handed. There are occasional ambidextrous people and there may be occasional ambidextrous in this model also. But handedness is a very important concept because sometimes people, MBTI gets stereotyped as putting people into boxes. It's nothing to do with boxes. Unfortunately, they depict it in boxes. <laughs> but it's not actually putting it in people in boxes. Um, basically, it's going to what you, letting you understand your natural default in each of the areas. So some of us have a natural default, like a right hand for the external world and some people's natural default, their, their right hand is the internal world. And that's where you more naturally gravitate. But of course, just like handedness, um, my mobile phone's over there, I've just put it over there now. I'm right-handed. I'm not going to turn around and go like that and get it. I'm going to use my left hand and get it. So, so no, nobody's in a box here. If, if, it may, if it makes more sense to be in the internal world, but your default is external, you'll be in the internal world. You can move from one to the other, but one is stronger, one is more natural. And it's important. And as we go through, we'll find out um, why it's so important. But does that concept of handedness make sense for, for you? Uh, yeah, what that reminds me of is that I, I've heard about, because I think we were talking the other day about it, that schools quite a lot of years ago used to try to force everybody to write with their right hand. Mm -hmm. And I think we're much more enlightened now that actually it is very unnatural for some people to do that. It's about a century ago now, thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and uh, but yes, they did. They used to tie the hand, left hand behind their backs. And some people did research and found it was causing brain damage. So that finally got people to stop doing it. I don't know the details of that research, but at least it's it got them to the idea that let people go with their natural flow, natural flow of things. It matters. Thanks for that reminder, John. And, and do you think then that? it's as strong as that and as built in as that for introversion, extroversion. I do. I absolutely do. Yeah. Personally, working with lots and lots of different people, um, you know, it, it's it, it in groups when you put them into the E group and the I group, then they've got some sort of task to do, which might be as something real if they're an intact team or uh, something, some other kind of thing. You just see it straight away. Yeah. You yeah. just see it. The I groups sit back for a little while and have a thing and then start talking in these like this and getting excited and, and then they'll go a bit quieter a bit later when they start to kind of um, put it all together, what they've said. So the, the, the best research for us is actually all those exercises that you can do with it because especially for business people, they're not always particularly interested in research. But when you do exercises like that and they see the different way of doing it, then they're like, wow, we're different where we are actually different so um and of course when we when we see all the different people in the world as you say it's really obvious that some are very extrovert so in in many things in science or the way you measure them you get a, a distribution curve mm -hmm. is it like that with introversion extroversion um well what it what it's like is that and um, because you want that what you get is you get your normal curve over on the east side and a normal curve over on the eye side because they are two hands it's not one it's not one continuum that's the difference between it and many personality uh, questionnaires where it's one continuum there is a there's a focus on the external world and a focus on the internal world and you've got a bell curve in each half so it's two processes two processes 
two so focuses in that two one. Two very different focuses. So the bit in the middle is actually quite uncommon. There's nothing there. In the it same way happen. as the extreme introvert or extreme extrovert are, are uncommon. The, the middle, middle is nothing. uncommon as well. The middle is nothing. Mm. There are two options, there are two hands. There's external world or internal world. Yes. So the differences are within either side of that. So that's what Jung started with. But there yes. are three more, aren't there? There are three more. Um, the, the next one, um, well, he, he sort of started to think, well, what do we have to do? What do people have to do? We have to perceive the world. We have to take information in. And then we have to make judgments based on that information. So the second one is about taking information in. And I don't, this isn't the way that Jung put it. This is the way I put it now. <laughs> he talked about that you can gather information with your feet on the ground. This is, or you can gather information from up in a helicopter. One time um, when I was working with the team and Ted the helicopter thing, and we worked a bit more with it, one of the teams said, you're satellite to one of the, one of the big, you're not a helicopter, you're in a satellite. So immediately people can start playing with it in ways and talk, of talking about difference. So what kind, what level of information do you pick up when you feature on the ground? Anybody can answer there, you can unmute and just say, no, do you want me to just say it? I mean, I can talk, I don't know if anybody else wants to come in. John, qualitative sort of um, information about what's going on. It's what, it's, it's right, it's what, it's, it's here, grounded. it's stuff, it's, Sense, it's real, your it's, senses, that, yeah. it's sensing, that's why it's called sensing. When you feature on the ground, you've got a limited perspective, but you can see the detail, everything is concrete, tangible, real stuff. And this is what Jung called sensing. Up in the helicopter, what do you pick up? John the big Nash. picture. The big picture. You can't see that level of detail, but you can start to see that different kind of forests grow in different areas and um, there's more rivers in one area and then in another. You can start to see connections between things. And so, this is where they you start to get theories well why why is it like that so the sensing is very much about what is it practical and what do we how do we do it and intuition we call it intuition it's a bad name but we're just we're stuck with it um because then everyone's intuitive i think and people have that natural instinct they get but he called it intuition up here it's like well well the question becomes why? So down here it's what and how, and up here the question is why and conceptual. Does that make sense? And it's also <laughs> really interesting that, I mean, I've got an app on my phone uh, for training your brain. I'll admit to that. But, that, but it's got <laughs> exercises in different areas. And one of them is atten attention. And I do really badly at those because I'm a helicopter view. So an example of one of the games for the attention is word search, which I thought oh. I was quite good at. But I'm consistently getting in the bottom 10% of the scores <laughs> relative to everybody else. So it, it's got to be, I guess, that when some people stare at those jumble of letters, they're instantly seeing the detail much better than I can. Yeah. I have yeah. to work really hard to go down and find those words. And I haven't realised quite how... How, how yes, how, exactly. It's really different. I'll yeah. just tell you a little story about my nephew. Um, I wanted to teach him this, and he was quite little. And um, I, 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 I was starting, trying to figure out what he was, but we, would, we used to do stories together, and I'd do a bit, and he'd do the next bit, whatever. And it, was, it always ended up being Thomas the Tank Engine, um, going out, waving at all the people, sunshine, coming home and, and, and everyone being happy. So I tried to mix it up one day being because I'm much more in the helicopter. So I said to him, today, Thomas the Tank wanted to do something different. Now, I thought that he'd be happy with that, but instantly his face darkened. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And anyway, so I said, today, Thomas wants to go to the moon. Well, then his face went, and then he looked at me as if I, he's only about four or five, as if I was the most stupid person on the planet. And I said, what, what's wrong with that, James? Why can't he go to the moon? Oh, Auntie Julie, 
I go, why? No, just explain to me why he can't. <sighs> Auntie Julie, there are no tracks on the moon. And I thought, he's a little practical one. He's a sensing type. So I thought, well, how do I get a, how do I get a little practical type onto the moon? So I had to think about this. So the next time I saw him, I said, I've been thinking, James. What if Bob the Builder went up to the moon first? And he started to look excited. And I said, right. and I said, yeah. And he said, yes, yes, Bob, Bob the Builder can build the tracks. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then he was like, okay, we, we're near the train tracks. He said, we can, the train can start near your house. Then it can go round the earth like this. And he knew that that wasn't really practical, this bit from the earth to the moon, but he was too excited and he jumped. And we went and we went on the moon and uh, but it was really interesting to to see how quickly and from the it really is from the beginning that your brain focuses more on one side than the other so i found it really I, i've just realized, just realized something after lots of years of writing software that i have always said i don't like computers i like what we do with them as opposed to the details but I've just realized when I'm writing software I'm continually trying to write software that's easy to read and I get really frustrated with programmers that they just have numbers and random things but of course they can read those yes <laughs> that's why my software looks much more like a story than theirs that looks like a I don't know a jumble of numbers yes wow Okay, after that's, that's really interesting, and 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 it is. I mean, if you look at um, when you see on the news the the people in the city, uh, and they've got these huge screens with tons of numbers on them, and they can they can make sense of that. Yeah, yeah I'd, be cry, I'd be crying my eyes out. I'd be like, take me away from this horror. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they, um, you know, they clearly can handle this these huge screens. Some of them have three screens full of numbers and that's the sensing brain that's the sensing brain it's, it's interesting after all these years I've, I've just literally in that way brought it back to the way i think and it's mm. not just that we're expressing our ideas in different ways we're mm. literally living in different worlds it, it, they are two different worlds yes they yeah. are they are um, but of course we all kind of live in a bit of both mm. but probably sensing people can live more in their own world we have to sometimes come to the sensing world and live there but maybe it's easier to ignore that other stuff up there i think it's quite interesting to think about that mm. don't know if we've got any sensing people okay so that's two yeah karen yeah i was oh, gonna sorry. ask how does this all relate to say kolb's learning styles because i've seen some clear links with what you're saying to yeah, yeah there's lots of research done looking at mbti in relation to all different other models i don't know Kolb's learning style um so much but um wh where would you see the styles fit in on this model oh, what we've said so far i'm just well I'm, uh, when i read Kolb, which is a while ago now i mean they seem to have the creative the theoretical the reflective and the concrete and ah oh, there I, we go I came uh, where I see myself as a concrete reflector yes, yes. Um, and struggled um, with theoretical academic side. Mm. But once I realized what I was, I found that theory was a <laughs> to understand the theory in terms of the concrete and reflections was oh, great wow. for me. Oh, wonderful. So the reflection bit is more to do with the um, external and internal, we've mapped that there on my MBTI, but your concrete and theoretical is exactly sensing and intuition. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things, uh, I don't know if you've heard of the big five, uh, any of you. Well, the first one is got various names like emotional reactiveness or neuroticism. The other four are Young's areas, They're completely Young's areas if you look at them. Completely openness is sensing and intuition, um, agreeableness is thinking and feeling, um, and I, I can't remember. And I can't remember what they call the one that's judging and planning. I can't remember. Conscientiousness, probably. I just remember the acronym Ocean. 
emotion. Ocean. Ocean. Ocean, the acronym for the first letter oh, okay. of all of the five right. of them. Right, right. And, and from my point of view, as we bring the platform online, I'm really looking forward to some people doing quite a few of these different tests and us doing a lot of research and actually demonstrating the correlation levels between, say, Big Five or Jungian, et cetera, just to see how close we do find they are. Uh, yes. And uh, the MBTI manual's got lots of uh, research data on um, correlations between different tests and different there's loads if um so do the MBTI uh, if as a sensing data. type karen you'd really like to get your ha teeth into all that data i'm sure so, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so right. do, do the mbti people agree that there's a very strong correlation with with ocean do they talk about that um the big five I, I don't know where uh, I'm an introvert, so I don't know whether lots of people talk about that, but um, um, it's in the books that it's in all the data that, um, okay. that, that these things correlate with lots of different tests. Yeah, yeah. They do. They do quite, there's a lot of data. There's that strange thing that goes on that anti MBTI um, movement that says there's no research, there's tons of research, absolutely tons. And one big area is uh, looking at it in relation to other models and other questionnaires. And of course, you've got the formal training as well, haven't you? Because often it's more the academics that say things like that. I've heard them say it, so which always seems a bit strange because to me, it's useful in the real world. It works. Uh, yeah, I was going to say the, the data that I'm most interested in is where they find, you know, um, correlations with different occupations and um, different ways of problem solving and things like that. Those kind of research, that's lots of research like that as well. And they're very, it's very interesting. Yeah. I've lost track of where we're up to. We've, we've just finished sensing, work. yeah, and <laughs> we've just finished sensing and intuition. And for those of you who don't know it that well, intuition is an N rather than an I, uh, because we've already used the I for internal. So I remember when they first told me that because that's a very sensing thing. I was like, what? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> it took me ages to figure out what they were talking about. Two eyes, what? <laughs> but anyway, so E and I, external, internal. S and N, sensing feet on the ground, N is up in the helicopter. So what's next? So what's next is, so, so there's the two worlds, there's two levels of information together. What Young said next, once we've got our information, we have to make judgments about it. So the next two are about two different, totally different approaches to judging data. One is thinking, which we're more familiar with, so that would have that would bring logic into looking at data, whatever that data be, whether it be at the sensing level or the um, theoretical level, and it would be. Um, so so, the thinking is like, let's be objective. Let's take emotion out of it. Let's use data. Let's find out what's right and what's wrong. The feeling process judges whatever the information is, because it may be emotion, some of the information may be emotion. Well, they say, well, you can't take emotion out of it. And so they actually, we can analyze emotion using empathy, um, not sympathy um, and necessarily, empathy often leads to sympathy, but it's an empathic analysis. It's saying, so if I was in their shoes, what would I, what would I be feeling? What would I be doing? How would I be seeing this situation? So they're two totally different processes, but both very important. So that's thinking and feeling. And stories about it might be to think of characters. So Alan Sugar, would you say he was a thinking type or a feeling type? Uh, I, I would say, uh, you can come off mute and say if you want to. Yeah, I'd say definitely thinking. He doesn't, yeah, yeah, he doesn't yeah. seem to, to listen to what everybody else is feeling first it, before he... It, Emotion like is you know yeah, yeah. out of there, just uh, results and uh, uh, success, right? And Richard Branson, I think, more so. of a I think more feeling. yeah, he's more feeling. Uh, uh, he's a business person, but um, I'll tell you, it's a, a, it's a bit of a sad story. But um, on a, I was on a Virgin train all the way from Scotland coming down back to Oxford one time. 
and it was packed and I was next to the people doing the coffee and so we, we built a bit of a rapport and um, towards the end there was hardly anybody there and, and we were talking and I said to him is Richard Branson as nice as he seems to be or presents his image to me and they said yes it's a sad story they to to repay but one of their colleagues committed suicide and um, what Richard Branson did was he came and talked to them people who knew her and got lots of information and wrote a letter to the parents um, using the information from the people that knew her and just said how sorry we all were that this had happened and how she'd been a wonderful member of the team and then all the stories and nobody knew about that publicly that wasn't you know he's often sort of like berated that he puts on these shows for people whatever that was done in total private total privacy and i felt that was some evidence around him being feeling also i remember when he very first came out i, um, I think you guys probably will as well um there was british airways and there was him and the British Airways people were all wearing suits and he was wearing his fluffy jumper. And they were all talking business and he was talking that he wanted, a, he wanted, um, he wanted systems that people enjoyed. He wanted people to enjoy. Um, he talked in, with emotional terms about wanting them to enjoy flying and making it fun and all of this kind of thing. So, um, He's still, he's still a very sharp business person, but I think he comes at it through um, thinking what, what do the clients want and what, what do the, my people want. Yeah, I mean, a very simple way of me oh, thinking John. about this a little bit was that while Richard Branson can be do a lot of thinking and understanding things, he comes across as a warm person mm. in, in very basic terms to, 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 that he's checking in with people, Howard, whereas... Alan Sugar is feels much colder. Well, it's thinking people value being strong and competitive, and so he puts, and that's and that's what he shows. Feeling people value being warm and empathic, and um, and that's and, and he does he does that as well. Yes, yeah. so it's very it's very fitting. So John, the other John underneath you, John wanted, is wanted to say something. I didn't know. I was just going to add that apparently when Branson was more engaged and involved in his businesses, what he used to do was he, when he was being driven around the country, he'd go into effectively the complaints department, uh -huh. grab a handful of letters from customers, and while he was being driven around, he'd actually ring them and deal with their complaints personally rather than it being done through the system and the process. Yes. Again, so the people were important and he dealt with it from inside looking out. The distinction I make is inside looking out or outside looking in. Yes, I think it's very useful. And um, he's, he is running his businesses as a feeling person. So mm -hmm. as a feeling person, it's like the first thing they look at is the market. Some organisations that are big and have been around a long time forget forget they've got customers almost, forget they've got clients because they're more thinking. So they're looking at the processes and and the job that needs to be done. So big businesses really need both of those, as in all of these, in in a in a, in a balance. But you can see that people have different biases. Yeah. Okay, John. So oh, we're on to the last one. Already. Well, maybe before we do, I just thought, can I just tell you a few more stories about thinking and feeling? Of course, um, yes, yeah, please do. Yeah. And so, one really great, there's a really great piece of research that takes um, psychology graduates and another bit takes law graduates. So, we're not looking at general, so, and then looks at where they go to next. So, psychology. Like graduates, they looked at, and let's see, see what you would predict, who goes to experimental psychology, which is working in laboratories and writing up papers, and who, who of, this is of thinking or feeling, would be attracted to going to clinical psychology, working with people with um, psychological disorders and unhappiness and depression. Which, what would your prediction be about who goes where from what we've said so far? So thinking, 
Karen? I think, I think as we go to experimental psychology and the feelers will go to the clinical side of things. That's right. We'll catch you, John, for the law one. And that's exactly what they found. Very statistically significant. So you've got a base of all of them in there, but a, huge, a bigger percentage of the thinking people were coming out going to experimental and a, a bigger part of the feeling were coming out and going to clinical. And they did it also with law, which I thought was again, again a really good study, and looked at who goes to um, commercial law and who goes to family law. So John, you, you can jump in with the predictions there. Yeah, I'd say the, the family law was the feelers mm -hmm. and the commercial law was the thinkers. And the data bore that out perfectly. And around about the time I was reading about this, um, I was working for a family law company. And the guy who headed it was um, an internal feeling type and, and, and intuitive. So he was internal, big picture and feeling. Mm -hmm. And 80% of the lawyers who worked with him were feeling types. 8%. Now, it's not 8% feeling type in commercial law at all. It's probably more like 80% thinking type in commercial. Um, so it's, it has those kind of, that kind of research to me is the most exciting of showing how it actually impacts on what people do in the world. Yeah. Okay, lovely. So again, in terms of our, our system and what we're building, it is one of the key things because a lot of people don't have access to these kind of tests. They haven't, they, they haven't got a coach. It costs a lot of money. Even if we can give people a little bit of insight into this and even catalyze that interest and just help them to, to perhaps think what career they do or it could be something that could be really helpful for people early on when they're thinking about careers or swapping careers or Absolutely. And I think it's also interesting politically, it could be really big. So let's think about the European Union. And you, uh, individuals have these um, preferences, but so do teams and so do organisations and so do countries. So if we think about Germany as a culture, would you say they were thinking or feeling as a culture? Which do they value most? Thinking. Germany. Uh, did I, say, did I say Germany? Yeah. You did say Germany. Yes, Germany's thinking. <laughs> Definitely. Greece. Lived there. Yeah, good. They are, yes. <laughs> I got pulled, pulled. I was just, I, had, I was in my daydream, introverted, intuitive, and I stepped on the road and this woman pulled me back because the, <laughs> because the light was red. <laughs> um, Greece, what, what culture are they? Thinking or feeling? Ooh. Yeah, that's feeling. Feeling. much more feeling, isn't it? Feeling. So I think quite a lot of the, the tensions and arguments between Germany and Greece have been thinking feeling arguments. Yeah, it's making sense to John Fisher. And it, it's, it, it, it's there, it's real. So it was kind of like that it was when we had some sort of other crisis. We, we seem to do nothing but crisis, really. But some, there was some financial crisis or whatever. And Germany was saying, you've got to get more fiscally um uh, responsible Greece and they said no we're feeding our pensioners they'd found out pensioners were going out in the night stealing food from bins in Athens in the country they were okay but in the cities if there's no money they couldn't get any food and so they said we're, and, and they showed these pictures on the news of these big canteens with all these uh, pensioners being fed and Greece was like well that's really flagrant use and they said well no that's, we're feeding our pensioners. We're not going to pay you what we need to pay you. And so, of course, they're two totally different um, focus. And what they need to do is figure out, right, both of those are valid. How do we bring it together? How do we do that? So I think it's incredibly powerful at all sorts of levels. Right, brilliant, good. Perhaps, uh, perhaps taking us to some of the other talks we've had on complexity, that it's actually, these things are very much mixed up. Because if Greece took that to the extreme and used all of their money, I know they wouldn't do this literally, no. but, but much all of the money to feed the pensioners, then they're not investing in the future. So there's complexity built into these. And actually, both sides have got something to put into this. And it's the balance, isn't it, really? 
I think Greece is also a sense income um, culture. So they don't think about the future enormously. My partner's Greek, he's Greek, he doesn't, he doesn't, they value the present. So that also adds in, I've not thought about that before, but that adds into it as well. That really adds into it there. And I'm really curious how much that is genetic, that those countries have got completely different gene pools with those different characteristics and how much of it is the culture it would be fascinating to explore. Perhaps not I, today, but... Mm. No, I, I agree. I, 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 my, my instinct is that it's um, influential individuals over history that create the culture somehow or another so i don't i wouldn't expect there to be majorly genetic differences but that there's been influential people either artists or or politicians or or characters that have kind of gelled it but there could even be genetic it'd be such an interesting <laughs> thing to um research wouldn't it i've got one more story in tnf the organ scandal do any of you remember the organ scandal yeah, they, 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 right, the surgeons were, right, so think of surgeons, do you think they're thinking, that that's a thinking culture or mostly thinking people or feeling? I think, think. <laughs> yes, mostly they're thinking. Um, nurses are mostly feeling. Um, so, anyway, so with good intention, a logical good intention, they were taking organs out of dead children to give to other children to save their lives. Perfectly logical and a very good intention. However, they didn't ask the parents permission, if you remember. They didn't ask the parents. And, and in fact, I think somebody said, well, when they asked a surgeon that, why didn't you ask? They said, well, because they would have said no. And we, we need these to save these other people, these other children's lives. I mean, they're already dead. What's the point? And um, so, of course, when it all was exposed, there was a huge uh, trauma about it, about parents not being asked. And, of course, some parents said that we would have said yes, and some would have said no. But the surgeons, purely logically, but with good intention, decided the best way to save lives was not to involve the parents in giving the consent. Isn't that fascinating? Absolutely fascinating. Maybe one other example, Julie, just for mm. the, the example list. Uh, remember 10, 12 years ago now with the financial crisis and the head of whoever it was, Fred the Shred, came out and said, the time is now for recriminations to stop. We've gone far enough past <laughs> it. And all the people are crying out and a lot of bad publicity because people were still in suffering uh, and in a lot of pain and mm -hmm. there was somebody in charge of one of the top UK banks coming from a very thinking perspective of we've done this for long enough now yeah. it's time to move on absolutely absolutely so a lot of I think English culture is a very hard one to figure out which we are on this and um, I think we're kind of thinking, but we've got a, an awareness of feeling. I can't really figure us out, but maybe I'm too close to it. Um, but it, it's a very important one in culture and very important to find some way of, of knowing when to use each function rather than get stuck in a, in a particular approach. Right, anyway, do you want the next one? Yes, John? please. The final one is kind of not like a separate one in a way, but um, I'll start off as if it is. So the, sec the very last one is that there are people who like order, structure and planning. And there are people who are firefighters, troubleshooters, who do their best when they're in a crisis situation or right up against the deadline. Yeah. So um, again, you can see the pros and cons of both sides and how ultimately you're going to need both somehow or another. I'm naturally on the troubleshooter firefighter side. And um, just before exams, I would just read it the night before. And there came this awful night when I couldn't read it through. So I ran into my dad and 
cry my eyes out and say, don't make me go to school tomorrow, Dad. I won't be able to do well on the exam. It will be awful because I can't get, don't make me. He says, all right, all right. Just a word from Dad's family. What do you do and, he, and so I just sat and watched television. Sat and, sat. and then I said, oh no, Dad. Oh no, this is going to keep happening. I don't know what to do. I had no natural J instinct in me at all. So I don't know. He said, go and see how many pages you can learn in an hour. And then I came back after an hour and said, I can learn four pages. He said, right. So you're off school tomorrow. You don't need to go to school tomorrow, but you've got the exam on Friday. I said, yes. He said, well, see how many hours you can actually work in on that Thursday. And you've got, you know, four, you know how many pages you have to learn. And that way you can make a plan. Like, oh. uh, to me, it was a revelation. And of course, I used it all. I've used it all the way through all the different <laughs> um, exams and things. But I had nothing of that in my natural instinct. But I do it well now. Still a little bit peevish, but I do it. I, 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 can, I can plan and do stuff. So you say you have no J in you. What, what are the two words, the two letters? J is judging and P is perceiving. And that's the bit where it's sort of strange. So it's basically saying, if we go back to sensing and intuition, those are perceiving, there are ways you perceive the world. So for people who are P, you're staying more in perceiving mode, gathering information. You're more interested in gathering and finding out and gathering. Judging people, it's saying that they put first the judging functions of making decisions either through thinking or feeling. So the judging people are people who are more happy when they can get to a decision and make a plan. So it goes back to, to which of those other two functions is um, the one that is more dominant for you. And it gets a bit complicated after that. But, so that's, that's why it's judging and perceiving. And part of what this project about is about, potentialization, was when I realised that I'd seen these Myers-Briggs Jungian ways of creating the four areas and the different kinds of people. But I'd also seen stage development theories where your whole philosophical outlook on life changes. And I've been fascinated by what that tower would look like of levels combined with personalities and i'm really fascinated by how does our worldview affect our personality and what's the relationship and that's some of the the research i want to see us do uh, and how does our personality affect our worldview <laughs> yes both ways around yes yeah both ways absolutely around. yeah and i think that learning about the other hand is part of the maturing levels mm. I think the more that we we learn, we learn my way is not the only way. There really is this opposite one. Oh, how weird is that? Oh, actually, it's quite useful. Oh, actually, they're really clever. Oh, actually, if we're together, it's like a yin and yang creating the whole. And so to me, those are the levels of maturity in relation to the um, Myers-Briggs model that individuals go to. And the fascinating thing is this whole opposites attract bit also helps us mature in that way. <laughs> But often we're attracted to people who are quite different and then you can learn about it um, as, as long as you can get rid of the more immature judgment and annoyance and frustration and all those things that we suffer from <laughs> naturally. So we've got four of these which gives us 16 different combinations mm. and I think I've heard you talk about that actually some of those combinations you can have if you put two people together that have got very different in, in all four mm. that, that they find it hard to communicate perhaps shall we say yes or, do you want to go are there anybody that you want to talk about that we might see yeah. strong differences i think i think we don't really have time to start really understanding putting all four together at this point in my mind i think just learning about the the, the single ones and i'd just like to, to tell a few more stories for the JP. And then the next step before going to all four is you can start to build quadrants. So like you can put extroversion together with thinking. And you can see, so extroversion is I'm out there and thinking is it's all about achievement. So, so these are your, your trumps of the world. Well, maybe not, these are, 
these are often business leaders and they're called fiery reds so they're quite action orientated and fast and get on with it and all of that and your opposite one is internal feeling which are your gandhis of the world of like values will save us and you know this is wrong and i'll sacrifice my life because the, the reality here is wrong and it, the difference between those so what i found is working with teams putting them into those quadrants is really really useful so you can sort of say well so i'm working with a bid team i, I might put them in um sensing with fit with thinking and, and intuition you know with thinking and sensing with fit, and say how are we going to win this bid so the nts will say well we've got to have some new ideas and innovation and strategy and um the sfs will say well do we know who the client is have we talked to them um actually so and so's got a really good relationship with so and so in that in, over there in that in that maybe we could get a bit of information about what's really important to them and 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 they go you know they go away and come back and realize again pieces of a jigsaw and isn't it good that we're different so you just get that isn't it good that we're different bit coming up um, so in a business when they've got big challenges or big jobs it's actually useful to put people into those teams and it's then maybe get them to come back together later yes i think well not necessarily into teams just say in a workshop put them in different corners so one i remember about change was um the leader was an np so big picture flexible adaptable just sort it out and um and then the other so the others the opposite to him is sensing with judging so i need the detail and we need a plan and then the others are the other two between it so what i did was put them in those four groups it was only him in np <laughs> um most of them were sj there were three sps and there were five njs and i said the, the thing is how do you feel about change and what's the best way to go about it so it wasn't necessarily this one, just how do you feel about change? What's the best way to go about it? You let him go first. He's like, I love change. I mean, you change is life. If you don't change, you die as a company. You've got to constantly be changing. Um, all this, you know, so and and then I went from him to his opposite diagonal SJ. We're rather worried about. We don't want you tipping the boat over. We don't want to lose everything that we've achieved. We think this has to be done very carefully. How will we change the procedures? How will we get this down to the individual who's doing this particular job? How about, well, no, quite worried about this really. So then we went to the NJ who said, but they, were, they were so excited. They were, and they said, we can be the bridge between you two. We're the bridge, we're the bridge between you two. Don't you try and run it. You just give us the inspirations. We'll take those into higher level actions and then we'll go to you guys to get all the actual actions that have to be done to get those high level actions done. And then we went to the SPs and they, they looked at us. I said, so what do you think? They said, oh, for goodness sake. This is a talking shop. Or you people really can talk, but you know, when something's broken, just come to us and we'll fix it. And that's all they wanted to say. They just wanted, they were practical fix it. If, it, if it's not, if this practical thing's not working, come to us and we'll fix it. But all this rest is just too high for looting for us. And it was fabulous. They really used it. They, they really stuck to that um, way of working together. And the change was, he said it was the, you know, it was better than they've ever managed to do before. Um, so, you know, still difficult, but better than they've done before. So uh, this stuff can be really useful in lots of different situations where we, we, we might work together. I have got to apologize for what I'm going to say next, <laughs> because I'm dragging it to a very high level because potentialization is a vision of how we can help a lot of people. And of course it will need all the detail of how it relates to different people in different ways 
But one of the big issues I think we're perhaps facing in the world is I, I don't think that the distribution between the 16 is even. And I, I, I think if I'm right, there are more detailed people in the world yes. than big picture. Yes. But what's happening in the world at the moment is, so which makes sense because in a, in a normal environment, you need a few people having the dreams and the plans, but actually most people are getting on and doing the details. But what's happening at the moment is artificial intelligence is actually going to replace a lot of the detail jobs. So I think going through the next few decades, perhaps, we've got challenges as to how we address to make sure we've got jobs and work and whatever it might be in society that fulfills everybody. We need, we're always going to need um, programmers and those are all the sensing types. Um, all of those kind of artificial intelligence machines will have to be built and programmed and that will keep lots of sensing people um, busy. But I think at a higher level it's, it's a, a very important thing to face and I think we have high levels of unemployment and we have to figure out, there's, there's the whole discussion of, about universal basic income and things like that. There's lots of discussions to have about. So if, if you create a, a society where loads of people simply have, even if they want to, and even if they give their heart to it, there isn't a job for them, the society, you, you, we're gonna, you'll get a lot of upheaval if you don't really anticipate this and figure out how on earth we're going to do it. And I know universal baking, base baking, basic income is one idea. Um, so it's yeah, that's, that's all very, it's, it's all very, um, and very important. If if it's universal bacon sandwiches, I'm for that. <laughs> uh, but another aspect of this is just that the jobs are changing faster and faster. So I think it's particularly important that we should be scanning the population and make looking at well-being and supporting people through change. There's a lot, lot coming in the next few years, and I suspect it will just get faster and faster. So we, so we have final questions from people. If anyone's got any, or were you just? No, that's good. Anybody who wants questions, please do. Or thoughts? Maybe not a question, more of. of one of the ways I've used MBTI training and awareness raising is really something that you both alluded to earlier. Um, and I've coached it under the framework of valuing differences. Mm. So the EDI stuff, uh, and I've used it in that sort of way of uh, this is where you realize and some of those things you taught right at the start even the way the extroverts and the introverts fill in flip charts um, and address an action and then once you debrief it afterwards as you say Julie the penny starts dropping immediately yeah. and it's helping them recognize the the relative merits and strengths of being overused or underused yes yeah it's very important if you haven't, we, we, we were talking about Trump and Biden when we were preparing for this. Um, and we thought that, that that might be quite fun um, to look at. Do you think, so if we look at Trump, is he E or I? I'd say Trump is E. And yeah. what would you say Biden is, E or I? I'd say Biden is, is, is closer to I. Yeah, yeah, does everyone agree? Yeah. So, um, uh, so Trump... Sensing or intuitive? I don't think he's got an intuitive bone in his body. Okay. He knows Biden. he has 206. Biden. I think that's an interesting one. I think before his sons committed suicide, I'm not as convinced he was as um, intuitive as he is now. And I think those experiences have changed slightly how he approaches things. So I think he's now closer to N and F, but I think things like Afghanistan are showing just how T it truly is underneath. 
I've no idea. We better not get into Afghanistan because I think that is incredibly complex. Whether that is an F or T action, definitely. Um, so, so um, we've got ES and IN, and um, what, what do we think on T and F for Trump and Biden? So you, you were saying thinking that Trump might be T and Biden might be F? Yeah. Okay. And then J and P. It, it's, it's actually quite hard to do this, isn't it, sometimes? And put, not put people in boxes, but because people play roles in jobs and have to do different aspects of it, uh, I think you've got to study it quite deeply to... Well, I'll, I'll just answer this one then. I think Trump is a P. Um, I don't think a J would ever have done that capital uh, uprising in Capitol House. I think that was all very emotive and um, very kind of just... I, 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 and I, I, I think he might be an, an ENTP or an ENFP. I think he's driven by emotion. Um, and he, I, I watched a programme about before he became, um, before he was becoming a politician and everything, he really put himself uh, with the working class and used to go on to wrestling um, stuff and all this kind of thing. It, it was very kind of emotive and physical and um, unpredictable what he was doing. Whereas Biden, I think, is INFJ. I think he's internal. I think he's strategic. I think he's... Um, feeling in J and, and Afghanistan I think is so complex it could easily be an F, F thing about returning the country to the people because um, we don't really know what America was doing there whether it was stealing oil or whatever it was we don't really know um, it's yeah very complicated I think but anyway so I would say in terms of Trump that he was he went, he was a, po he's a populist, so he followed what he thought would be best for him. What does that make him then? Perceptive or? No, I think that then is getting into values, which is other areas that people have differences. Okay. So, yeah, so these things are about the processes in those areas. It's a great thing to have brought up. And then, of course, there's values and all sorts of other, um, other aspects to character. And so I think there's different values there. Which obviously we could do another session on at some point, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I think uh, anybody got any last questions, or I think I think it's time to wrap up and say thank you, Julie. Uh, mm. I, I've never done formal training in psychology. I've kind of picked up the Jungian stuff from having seen it a lot from people doing tests, but. I especially want to say thank you today because I've learned, I, I, it had never quite clicked in the way that you described the path through the letters. Okay. Which makes a lot of sense. It's not just four random things. It's, no. It really is a process that we go through mm. and the way we, we, we process the world through those different letters in a different sense of how do we pull information in? What do we do with it? How do we make a decision? So that was really fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming and, um, and joining in with me. Thank you very much. And I'm hoping a lot of people will be watching the video uh, in the future as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much, Julie. Right. That was yeah. interesting. Loved some of the metaphors and the, uh, the examples that you used to bring it to life. So that mm. was really nice. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, it was a great, great introduction for me. So thank you very much. Lovely. Good.